Mayor City Council is now in session. Would the clerk please take the roll? Council Member Sasson? Here. Council Member Culver? Present. Council Member Marshall? Present. Council Member Shrebnik? Here. Council Member Lutzis? Here. Deputy Mayor O'Kane? Here. Mayor Herbig? Here. All present. Next on the agenda is the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the city of Kenmore is situated upon the ancestral lands of the Snohomish, Snoqualmie, Soxhawatl, Duwamish, Stillaguamish, Tulalip, Suquamish, Muckleshoot, and other tribes who are part of the Coast Salish peoples. We recognize and express our deepest uh, respect for their enduring stewardship and profound relationship with this land, which they have cherished and protected since time immemorial. We honor the First Peoples, acknowledge their vibrant cultures, and commit ourselves to learning from their wisdom in our journey to promote justice, equity, and mutual understanding. We pledge to stand alongside these communities in acknowledging past injustices and working towards a future that respects and celebrates the diverse heritage of this land. Now, if you all please stand and join me in the flag salute. Next on the agenda is approval of the agenda. Unless there are any objections, the agenda will stand approved. There are no objections. The agenda is stand, stands approved. Uh, next, we have two proclamations. Uh, first one is for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Whereas sexual assault is a pervasive and deeply troubling widespread issue affecting individuals of all ages, genders, and backgrounds, and whereas trauma inflicted by sexual violence extends far beyond the immediate physical harm often resulting in long-term emotional and psychological consequences for survivors and their loved ones, and whereas individual and community impacts of sexual violence are rooted in the compound and compounded by racism, sexism, heterosexism, and other forms of oppression, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, people living in poverty, LGBTQ plus people, elders, people with disabilities, and other people targeted by oppression are disproportionately affected by sexual violence in significant and, com and complex ways. And whereas the goal of Sexual Assault Awareness Month is to raise public awareness about sexual violence and educate communities on how to prevent it, as well as an opportunity to honor, <clears throat> excuse me, the resiliency and healing of survivors, and whereas Sexual Assault Awareness Month presents a reminder for us to come together as a society to confront the issue, challenge harmful attitudes and behaviors, and foster a culture of respect, consent, and inequality. And whereas working together as a community, we can help alleviate the trauma of sexual violence by ensuring supportive resources are available to all survivors while standing up to and actively disrupting harmful attitudes and behaviors that contribute to sexual violence. Now, therefore, I, Nigel Herbig, Mayor of the City of Kenmore, on behalf of the City Council, join advocates and communities across uh, through King County and Washington State in taking action to prevent sexual violence by standing with survivors and proclaiming April 2024 as Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Together, we uh, commit to a safer future for every person in our community. And we have a second proclamation for Child Abuse Prevention Month. Whereas all children deserve to grow up in a safe and nurturing environment to ensure that they reach their full potential and become confident in the successful adults. And whereas our children are our most valuable resource and will help shape in the future of Kenmore and beyond. And whereas child abuse and neglect continue to be significant issues affecting families and communities where the consequences of child abuse extend far beyond childhood, often leading to long-term physical, emotional, and psychological harm that can persist into adulthood. And whereas it is everybody's collective responsibility to protect the well being of our children, provide support for families in crisis, and empower communities to prevent and address child maltreatment. And whereas Child Abuse Prevention Month serves as a reminder of the importance of coming together as a society to raise awareness, promote prevention strategies, and support survivors of abuse and neglect. And whereas by fostering strong partnerships among families, educators, healthcare providers, law enforcement, and community organizations, we can create safer environments where children can thrive and reach their full potential. Now, therefore, I, Nigel Herbig, Mayor of the City of Kenmore, on behalf of the City Council, do hereby proclaim April 2024 to be Child Abuse Prevention Month throughout the City of Kenmore and call upon all of our residents to join in efforts to build a brighter future for our children.
Next on the agenda is a recognition. Well, I would like to recognize our outgoing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility advisory committee member, Erica Del Villar. And I have a note from Nancy Tai, who is the chair of the DEIA advisory committee I'd like to read. And we have Erica here in the audience to be recognized. So this is from Nancy Tai. She says, it's been a joy to serve alongside Erica on the D city's DEIA advisory committee since it first formed in 2022. Erica brought valuable insights, thoughtfulness, and questions. I really appreciated not only her different perspectives and lived experiences, but also that she spoke up to support other DEIA members and their viewpoints. The strength of our committee is each member bringing diverse perspectives while still being open to learn from one another and considering something new, all with the focus of better serving our city and neighbors. While I will miss having Erica's perspective at meetings, I know she's bringing her brilliance and expertise to wherever she is headed next. We wanna thank Erica for her service and wish her well in her next adventure professionally. Erica, do you wanna come up and get a picture with the council and I'll give you this? <laughs> Deputy City Manager, where is the fun? So where's the fun this week? We're very excited. So the people you see in this picture are three Kenmore, well, all four of us work at the city, but Tambi Cork, Carla Schnee, and Sam Samantha Loyuk all graduated from the Northwest Women's Leadership Academy. Kenmore had the largest contingent, not that I'm competitive or anything, but it was fun to have three employees in the cohort. The Northwest Women's Leadership Academy is sponsored by the Washington City County Management Association, and it was developed to help women and non-binary local government professionals advance in their careers. And we're really proud to have had Tammy and Carla and Sam in the cohort. They just graduated and we're already starting recruitment for the next cohort, uh, opens on April 26th and closes on May 27th. And we're hoping we'll get some more Kenmore employees in the next cohort of the Academy and um, just wanted to recognize Tambi and Carla. Samantha's on vacation, so she's not here with us tonight, but Carla and Tambi are here. And it's a big, it's very competitive to get into the Academy. It's a big accomplishment to finish the program and really excited for them to now bring everything they learned back to the city. Awesome, congratulations. Uh, next up, we've got public comment. I want to welcome everyone to the council's meeting. Please address your comments to the mayor and the council. You'll have three minutes to speak. Um, unless there are more than 20 speakers, then we'll reduce that down to two. The clerk will call your name in the um, when it is your turn. The presiding officer may choose to alternate between in per. Actually, we don't have any online folks, so I'll skip that part. Uh, please state your name and city of residence and keep within the allotted time uh, to make every person feel welcome and safe here. Please refrain, refrain from booing, clapping, heckling, yelling, or other interruptions. The meeting is recorded for transparency. Thank you for being here and for sharing your input respectfully. Clerk. Thank you, Mayor. We have five members on site wishing to speak. Edward LaSalle, Jennifer Anderson, Kara Macias, Jeff Chisholm, and Elizabeth Mooney. Edward LaSalle, Ken Moore. Hello, all. I wanted to speak today in favor of more accessible healthcare for our residents in light of today's agenda and the community service surveys results. As a whole, Kenmore and the North Region of King County tend to be healthier than other parts of our county and state, which is a very positive thing. If we look a bit deeper, however, we see that according to King County public health data, we have a population that tends to be more disabled, more overweight, and with a higher diabetes prevalence than the county average. Sadly, the impacts of metabolic diseases are the strongest years after the onset of the illness, so I recommend we tackle it now to avoid paying for it more later. Mental health is also an element I wish the council looks into further as our area sadly ranks second 
across King County for high school depression, self-harm, and attempted suicide and suicides themselves. This unfortunate track record can be echoed in the survey results where the highest single service requested in the last 12 months was finding support to address emotional needs or mental health counseling, higher only to finding support to access medical care or medical insurance. We all know the toll COVID took on our sanity and will likely have to deal with those ripples for years to come. Be it cardiovascular diseases or mental health issues, none of it really matters if we can't get access to accessible health care, both financially and logistically. In the last five years, almost 5% of our residents postponed a necessary visit to the doctor due to the associated costs. More generally, 7% of Kenmore residents are uninsured and more than 3,000 of our neighbors are enrolled in Medicaid, which severely restricts access to care, as you know. Being healthy because undiagnosed is a very different situation than receiving a clean bill of health from a physician. 28% of Kenmore residents did not visit a dentist this past year and 17% of us do not have regular prim primary care providers. Obviously, the city cannot address these needs on its own, and I believe it would be best if the city was to partner with our neighbors in Bothell, Lake Forest Park, Shoreline, and others to work with King County Public Health and Evergreen Health, which is our area's public hospital, to find affordable and public health care solutions for our community. As these objectives all fit perfectly with the county's public health hospitals for a healthier community initiative, I'm hopeful you will find collaborative and engaged partners at the county level to improve access to care in our community. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, council members, Jennifer Anderson. I live here in Kedmore. I first wanted to take just a very short second to tell you a fantastic story about my five-year-old who actually, um, because of the arts of Kemore and all they've done in our community, was able to participate in the painting of the uh, stairs outside of City Hall. And every time we go by, he is so excited to see it and so excited to celebrate the fact that our city is inclusive of all people. So I just wanted to highlight that for a minute. I'm here to talk um, mostly about affordable housing today in light of your agenda later. Um, uh, several of our community members did send you a letter earlier today that highlights in more detail some of our um, our uh, points, but um, I just wanted to highlight the fact that um, we are very eager um, and supportive of Kim Moore um, moving forward to um, not only review, but additionally add in um, code for supportive housing opportunities um, at the city level. And I did want to point out though, that because there is some discussion you'll uh, on the agenda for tonight about creating an additional um, housing committee. And I'm very hesitant to support that because I do not think that our, um, the people who need the housing the most need, I don't think that low income housing, um, affordable housing, sustainable housing needs to undergo um, even further scrutiny. We have plenty of avenues in the city already for people to um, submit their input. We have the planning commission. Um, we have the DEIA advisory committee that can help with issues. And you're talking about establishing a um, healthcare uh, committee that will be able to coordinate and work together to provide the services that our community is asking for when you look at types of um, low income and supportive housing. So I just want to encourage you to kind of um, look at that in a broader lens of not allowing um, additional scrutiny from people who don't need to access those services to prevent the services from coming here. Thank you so much for your time. Hi, Kara Macias, Kenmore, Washington, uh, Council, Deputy Mayor. Um, I just wanted to flag a couple things as we continue our discussion on missing middle and permanent supportive housing updates to the comp plan. There's a couple things that I've kind of felt have been overlooked during discussions, and hopefully you can kind of keep it top of mind, bring it forward as we're moving forward in discussions. Um, 
What's kind of been missing for me is permanent supportive housing is not a one size fits all. It is different sizes. It comes in all shapes. It comes in all sizes. There's multiple options for permanent supportive housing, but I don't think that's clearly been defined as we continue on in this path of discussion. When I look at uh, 2050 and 2050 and beyond, I don't see Plymouth housing operators in five buildings with 100 units each. That's just I think that we need to kind of define that and get that into people's minds. Um, I'm also, there's great concern that we do have significant displacement risk with some of our low income, specifically the mobile home parks of which we have six. And should we ever lose, uh, lose a lawsuit or that zoning changes, those people will have no place to go. They won't have anywhere to fit here and we'll create our own zero to 30% hazard that we don't currently have. So I think when we're looking forward on this, there's a big need for 30 to 50 and 50 to 80 as well, that I think we're so focused on one avenue, we're missing a bunch. Um, and I do wanna include that part of that is workforce housing and whether we like it or not, workforce drives. I'm part of the trades. I drive, people drive. We do need to look at that. If we plug this hole, it will spill out to neighborhoods, creating more hazards where we don't have sidewalks. We have people walking and we're again, creating hazard we didn't have before. I just think we have to look at this as a big global, big picture. Um, lastly, since it is sexual awareness uh, month proclamation, um, King County Sexual Assault Resource Center, kcsarc.org has fantastic resources for survivors and for people. So check that out. Good evening, Mayor Council, Jeff Chisholm, Ken Moore. Um, I wanna speak about housing in a broader sense. Uh, without housing, the subcategory of affordable or low income really doesn't mean much. And there's a big gap in the housing available in Kenmore, and that is apartments. Uh, if you want to buy a home in Kenmore, the average sales price, according to Redfin, is over a million dollars. Cheapest home you can get is a one bedroom ground floor uh, apartment over here where uh, Murphy's used to be. That's $500,000. Uh, to qualify for a mortgage, you need 50,000 in the bank and be making about 130,000 a year. Everyone else in Kenmore is renting. We've had three new apartments built in Kenmore in the last decade. The Flyway, the Link, and Spencer 68. That's it. But a Bothell, apartments all over the place. Lake City, all over the place. Juanita, uh, Kirkland, Alderwood, they're everywhere. Why aren't apartment builders willing to come to Kenmore? Now, I think I know the answer. I suspect some of you do. We don't have the time tonight to discuss it. But if you're really serious about bringing housing and affordable housing to Kenmore, you, the big picture people, need to figure out why it is that apartment developers are not building apartments in Kenmore. We've got condos coming out everywhere. Every new construction going in is condominiums. We've actually lost apartment buildings when the uh, 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 apartments, uh, the apartments that used to be over here where the drive-in movie theater uh, converted to condominiums. So I do urge you, and I'll give you my two cents worth if any of you care, what I really urge you to do is talk to some apartment developers and find out why they're not willing to build in Kenmore. You've had one developer in the last decade who's willing to touch the city with a 10-foot pole, and that's Main Street. They built the three across the street. They pulled out from the one uh, uh, up where um, uh, Teo's Mia Roma is going to be. I've talked to several developers. I can tell you why they won't touch the city of Kenmore with a 10 foot pole, but you as the master planners, I really urge you if you're serious about housing in Kenmore, figure out why it is that nobody wants to build an apartment here. They'll do it in Bothell, they'll do it in every other city around here. Why don't people want to build apartments in Kenmore? You won't solve affordable housing until you solve the issue of providing housing for people who make less than $130,000 a year. Thank you. Ms. Mooney. Hi, Council. Happy spring. Um, my name is Elizabeth Mooney and I live in Kenmore. Good to see you. Um, I wanna thank you for your past efforts for 
clean air. Um, I'm here to basically remind you that I do care. We do care about clean air and clean water at our shoreline. And I know it's super complicated, but I'm here to thank you for the years that we worked on trying to get a better outcome with the asphalt emissions. So it is good to know, and I don't know how many people in our community know that the asphalt emissions are now being monitored. That's just since August, 2023 that they passed. Um, and reportedly they are in compliance as of that date. Um, I will say that I don't think it's healthy to breathe asphalt emissions. And we already have Bothell Way with a bunch of cars that we have to breathe that. But, but now here we are, and I think the city should look at our future and we have a new council and our future shoreline doesn't really need to include an asphalt plant, especially a nice old one that is leased by the, um, the concrete company there. Um, and thanks to these Lake Point um, meetings that you've been having, I went to the last one at Moreland's, really fun. Um, thank you, it was fun to chat with Debbie Bent. Thank you, Debbie Bent. Um, the asphalt emissions are ones that my grandkids, as we drive through to go to our violin lessons, they smell it sometimes, not all the time, but now they just go, go away asphalt, go away asphalt, go away asphalt. And I will say the nice person that works for um, the company, he is nice, but they're not making our air clean. So let's work with our um, long-term vision, um, the future of Lake Point, the city vision should include a vision without an adjacent asphalt plant. And I can't imagine any developer who would wanna develop a lake point if there's an operating asphalt plant there right next door. And I'm sorry I haven't been coming here to remind us how much we wanna get rid of asphalt. The guy that works for them is super nice. I hope he would work instead on a new narrative for clean air, um, environmental restoration at our shoreline and um, you know, let's just move towards getting rid of an old asphalt plant in Kenmore and develop environmental restoration. Salmon coming back to our small tributaries. And um, we'll talk about it at our, at our PERC meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mooney and guests. Mayor Herbig, that is the final on-site public comment and we had no virtual signups this evening. All right, I wanna thank everybody for coming and participating in public comment. Uh, next on the agenda is our consent agenda. The chair would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The consent agenda is adopted unanimously. Uh, next up, presentation, State of the College, the Cascadia Roadshow, presented by Cascadia College President, Dr. Eric uh, Murray. Dr. Murray. Good evening, Council, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for having me. This is the annual State of the College address about Cascadia. And we've rescheduled for various reasons three times so, uh, since last September. The good news about that is I get to now speak to all of the new council members who are here and you get to hear this annual presentation about the college. Before I get started, one little personal side note, I live in Lake Forest Park, but as I was driving in today, I, I passed by and counted 12 businesses that I frequently engage here in Kenmore. Kenmore is my adopted home and has all of the amenities from my dry cleaner to my dentist. And so it's kind of an extra special thing for me to be here with you all because I adopt you and you've adopted me and, and we know that Lake Forest Park isn't quite as expansive as Kenmore is with what it offers. So thank you for being here. So the state of the college, if you don't know already, the community college in Bothell, Cascadia is defined by the school districts that it serves. So it serves North Shore, Riverview and Lake Washington school districts, which means we serve the cities of Kenmore, Bothell, Kirkland, Woodenville, Redmond, Duval and Carnation. Those seven cities make up the cities that we represent. And so we come and talk to the councils and uh, offer you an insight into our world and how we're doing because we serve your young people and your continuing adult learners. So we just call this the roadshow. 
now, and we're going to go through some highlights. So another good part about the little bit of a delay in presenting to you is not only am I talking about last year, I'm now talking about the last four or five months, and we have a lot of success to report. And we'll go through four quickly four different areas of student success, equity, access, and growth. So with regard to student success, just some tidbits for you. This is kind of the elevator speech uh, in that we have the highest percentage of students who transfer to a four-year university that may be a little self uh, evident because of our co-location with the University of Washington Bothell. More than 66% of our students move on to the University of Washington, whether it be the Seattle or the Bothell campuses. And that's the highest in the community college uh, system. Also, by the way, this data I'm presenting was collected by our state board, not by us individually. So we were told that this is our data. Uh, and after college earnings for Cascadia are 9% higher than any of the other 33 community colleges in the state. Our business graduates earn $16,000 more and our IT graduates earn $11,000 more. I can't tell you why, other than maybe we're just really good at what we do, but our students are showing some success when they get out into the workforce. Other metrics uh, we have uh, with regard to student success, we have new academic transfer pathways to University of Washington Bothell. We'll talk about in, in a minute about our new uh, engineering STEM building. But we, for the first time ever, have now a guaranteed pathway. If a student starts in engineering at Cascadia, they will automatically be accepted into the University of Washington Bothell because of the, the co-location and the efforts we've made to make sure the pathways uh, are available to our students. We have something very similar in computer science, and we're looking at other degree pathways to make sure that when you start at Cascadia, that you can get on to the university. Not every student gets admitted to UW initially. Not every student can afford UW initially. Not every student has the academic skills necessary to get there. But our students show by the end of two years that they are university ready and hence University of Washington Bothell works closely with us. Uh, we've seen an increase in our student retention rate. Cascadia has one of the highest retention rates from fall first year to fall second year of any community college in the nation. On average, that's about 49%. For Cascadia, we are at about 92%. That's up from 89% in past years. So we are seeing this increase in retention. Students stick with us when they start. Um, and uh, Deputy Mayor Okana, <laughs> we're talking a little bit before, she says uh, her child came and just felt like we care at Cascadia. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have our retention rate. Uh, we also have the highest percentage of students who come in not prepared for university or college level math or English and getting them into uh, college level classes. We have the highest success rate in the 34 college system of making that happen. Equity and inclusion is important to us and part of our mission. And we have the lens of diversity, equity, inclusion in everything we do. We've now had three years of a mentorship program for uh, marginal, historically marginalized students where they get uh, mentors assigned to them and other kinds of services. That program grew to over 100 students this year and it keeps growing. Our foundation raises scholarship money for them as well. And now we have some data to show that their graduation rate, rates are quadruple graduation rates of students who don't have or can't participate in a mentorship program. Mentorship helps students, and it's closing the gap for historic, historically marginalized students to succeed while at Cascadia. We also have what we call our Equity and Inclusion Foundations course. It's something we developed for our employees. It's a 10-month course, once a month, with re, uh, required readings that helps them understand the basic premise of equity and inclusion. That course has been so popular that uh, a few local school districts have asked to send folks to it. Our state community college board has asked to send folks to it, and the King County Public Library has asked to send folks to it. We are now enlarging that program so that we can have a community for pay uh, access to helping other communities, nonprofits, uh, learn about equity and inclusion. Uh, if you have a student in one of the school districts, you may be aware of our student of color conferences. We uh, bring, last year we brought over 600 students of color from the three school districts that we serve to Cascadia on three different days to expose them to higher education. North Shore School District calls it their social justice conference. They program around social justice, but we always, always have an opportunity to talk about what it means to be on campus. And we are, we are seeing higher application rates of those students than the general population, just simply because of the exposure of being on campus. And 
as of this year, um, we don't even serve Snoqualmie School District, but they asked if they could have one. So we paired them up with Riverview and they're coming. And the Northwest Educational Service District, which represents, I think, 16 different school districts, is bringing a group of three us next month as well. We're now offering four conferences serving five jurisdictions. That's an ever growing popular thing, an underserved need in our community. And we keep increasing our staff to help attend to students' needs. I wanna talk about access and some of this is academic access. Some of this is just physical access. Uh, we now have something called guided pathways. It's a new way to think about advising and you study a meta major. You don't study an individual major at community college. And those seven meta majors will prepare you for the multiple sub majors when you get to university. So you can take life sciences, for example, and take the general core, and then you're ready at UW to go to psychology or sociology or any of the other life sciences that are out there. And that's helping students uh, not have to be so definitive in the first two years and then find their way when they get to the university. One of the things that you all might be pretty proud of is in the past, you have uh, passed a grant to help us uh, reduce learning gaps of Kenmore students. And that program is underway. We're working between the city, North Shore School District, Inglemore High School, uh, and Cascadia to do uh, extensive after school tutoring to help students who are not college ready get to be college ready. Uh, and that uh, the premise of that program is so popular that other cities are looking to maybe try to figure out how they can also invest in that particular program. And so that's just one way that we can increase access to the community college. One thing to think about with the pandemic is that when it happened, we had some learning gaps for students who were uh, in high school and then through 11th and 12th grade the last couple of years, they've been behind. So we're catching them up. But we have to also remember that every generation, every couple years of students has a gap of some kind. Middle schoolers are experiencing social gaps, how to interact in a social environment. And that social maturity is coming later. Reading is coming later for second, third, and fourth graders. It's now happening in the fourth and fifth and sixth grades. So we're gonna see a whole 18 year generation of students who are gonna need some kind of help to be college ready when they get um, to that place in their life. And that's one of the reasons Cascadia is here. Not so much important maybe to Kenmore, but this is absolutely important to Redmond and the Redmond City Councils. We now have an extension site in Redmond. If you're familiar with the Together Center, which houses 20 nonprofits, including Cascadia. We have a classroom there um, over which are six stories of affordable housing. And we offer not only English as a second language courses, but running start courses for students who can don't have to drive all the way up to Redmond, or I'm sorry, don't have to drive from Redmond all the way up to Bothell to get to their running start classes. They can run over from Redmond High School, get their English or their math, take their running start class and get back. So um, that is a three-year trial program. We're just finishing the first year and we've got two more years to see if we're gonna take hold on that. And then growth. Uh, some of you, I think we're at our grand opening of Innovation Hall in November. If you haven't been to campus or haven't seen that building, it's a marvelous $80 million uh, state-of-the-art science building that we built with the University of Washington. Our faculty members are side by side, our students are side by side, our classes are intermingled, the curriculum leads from Cascadia to, to the university seamlessly, and the building represents physically the concept of this co-location and a Cascadia a community college and a university being side by side. We're pretty proud of that one. And then uh, Hopefully next legislative session, we get the $40 million for the new gateway building, which goes on campus. That's our student services center, three stories of all of our student services located in one place. So a student only has to go to one place and it looks like we're next on the list to get that. Don't confuse that. If you go over to Bothell with all of the new housing that the University of Washington is building, over a thousand beds. And we just learned last week that they've invited Cascadia students to also participate and become residents in their housing. And so that's pretty exciting for us that our community college students and our university students can co-mingle in on campus housing. So that's pretty spectacular. That's about it. That's a lot. What I can say even now into, uh, we're just about, we started spring quarter today. Uh, we have had double digit enrollment growth for the last five quarters. You may have heard me last year come and be a little sad because the pandemic really hurt our enrollment and we can't thrive, we can't have the revenue needed to support our community college functions without that enrollment. 
through the pandemic, we dropped 45% of our students. We are now back to almost the same level as 2019. Uh, and that's just a huge rebound for us. And we're really excited to be back in this place. It, it means that our community needs this college everywhere from Kenmore to Redmond out to Carnage. I'm happy to answer your questions. Any questions? Councilor Marshall. Thank you. What a reassuring presentation and awesome numbers for everything you're doing. <laughs> that was certainly sobering to see the impact of COVID. And I'm further reassured that you guys are recognizing it even at all the different levels and definitely doing something about it. Have more classes since COVID become live or is it still the same level of virtual? Uh, so pre-COVID, we were 90% in person, 10% online. During COVID, that was reversed, 90% online. We had to do some lab classes in person. We are now following the trend of what students desire when they register. We are at 70% in person and 30% online. We can toggle between those things as we need to, but right now students want to be in person. And I think the student that we serve learns the best when they can be in person. Councilor Lucis. Uh, no question. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I've had family, I've had friends go through Cascadia um, and it's a fantastic institution right in our backyard that helps our community reach that next level of higher education and really brings us together and strengthens our community. So I, I just want to say as a current college student, thank you. I love this. This is great and very exciting to see the growth that we have. So thank you very much. Exciting to see younger people getting involved in civics too. Um, we think about our world today and we need, we need all perspectives from all generations helping shape where we are. So thank you. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I, I just wanna echo um, my fellow council members. Thank you. We are so fortunate to have a community college in our area that is such a leader, the smooth transition from community college to UW, the way that you inter in intermingle students, it's just amazing. I mean, I, 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 I knew that was happening, but just listening to your presentation kind of made my heart grow, you know, because anyway, thank you. And my daughter really, she, she can't say enough good things about going to Cascadia. Um, at least once a week, she has a comment. I mean, she, she was going to UCSB in California, as we discussed, and leaving a university to community college, being in the environment at Cascadia for her. She left you know, Isla Vista for Bothell, and she is so happy at Cascadia, and she has plans for her future. She'll be at UW next year. So thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to belabor what everybody has said, but I think you know that that we really view you as, a, as an important partner with the city. We appreciate everything that you, um, well, I mean, your, your partnership with the city is pretty profound. I don't think a lot of people understand all of it, but we really appreciate how you, how closely you work with us uh, to better serve our, our, you know, our young adults and set them up for success. Um, and um, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to come out here too. I, I do want to give a shout out to city manager, Carl Lindsay. He is uh, by my side at multiple community events, and uh, he is a, also a diehard fan. And without his continued enthusiasm and investment, um, it just shows that Kenmore cares. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you earlier than a year from now. Um, but I hope we cross paths. Thanks very much. Anytime. Thank you. All right. Next up, we've got a study session on human services needs assessment. We're going to go on down to the tables to have a more informal discussion for that.
All right, so this is a presentation uh, by our Housing Human Services Manager, Tammy Cork, and HMA Senior Consultant, Dr. Megan Beers. Tammy. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Um, we are very excited to be here tonight to share some initial themes from the uh, Kenmore Human Services Needs Assessment Community Engagement Work. I am joined tonight by Megan Beers, Dr. Megan Beers, who is a Senior Consultant with Health Management Associates. We'll start by just letting um, you, Megan, if you can introduce yourself briefly. Excellent. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Wonderful to be here with you all. Um, my name is Megan Beers. Um, I work at Health Management Associates. We're a, a national um, consulting firm focused on health and human services. I work in the Seattle office, um, longtime King County resident. I'm a clinical psychologist by training, but do most of my work um, in the human service sector in King County um, and have been delighted to partner with uh, the city of Kenmore on this assessment and uh, excited to share the themes with you this evening. Great, so our agenda for this evening is we'll start with just a brief background of how we got here today in terms of human services at the city of Kenmore. And then Megan will walk us through some of the methodology and demographics of some community engagement and community, including a community survey that we have done over the past few months. Um, we'll round that out with some of the results and key themes from this uh, initial community engagement, and then talk about some next steps for um, finalizing this report and thinking about strategic planning and um, how to support the community in the coming years. So as a background for how we got here today, the, the city of Kimmore has invested in human services for more than a decade. Um, as far back as I could find, it started really um, probably before 2017, but that was the first time I could find a per capita rate that the city had set aside as um, grants for direct service providers. Um, that, that per capita rate has been set at about $7.53 per year since that time. And so what that means is there's roughly $180,000 per year that the city contributes to um, regional nonprofits and service providers to um, augment the services that are available to Kenmore residents. This um, current year, um, there's about 29 programs at 17 agencies that are funded. This is both through that, uh, you know, roughly $180,000 from the general fund, and then additionally some one-time um, special projects funds that were influenced by the community engagement around the American Rescue Plan Act dollars. Um, so it's a little bit more than $180,000 um, in the 23-24 biennium. This has been a staff-led process um, historically where the, the grant applications were reviewed internally and those um, uh, recommendations were brought to council as part of the biennial um, budget process. Uh, in February of 2023, so roughly a year ago, the city council decided to make an additional investment in a housing and human services manager uh, to do a needs assessment, which is what we're here to talk about today and expand the impact of housing and human services work for residents um, here at the city of Kenmore. Um, as I approached this work um, with Health Management Associates, we, um, we started with some guiding principles, and this is one element of the um, draft needs assessment that will be open to community input and council input. Um, this is where we landed. This was driven by um, our background in human services, and I've just briefly listed them on the, um, the slide. There's additional um, kind of narrative around it in the agenda packet, but we strove to um, approach thinking about needs within this community by centering diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, thinking about partnership. We can't do this alone. This is a regional and collaborative effort. Um, community engagement, uh, human services is about people. We need to do it with the people that we're serving. Um, being responsible, being fiscally um, stewards, uh, uh, strong fiscal stewards of the city's funds to ensure we're being effective with every dollar that we spend. Um, transparency and trust. We want to do this in full view of the public. We want to do this with the community. And really focusing on strengths and opportunities. There are so many um, valuable elements to the Kenmore community that are creating this a place where people thrive. And there are also opportunities for us to do more for vulnerable populations that are uh, facing challenges. And then also just having a short and long-term focus. There are some things we can do right now, and that will be part of the next steps conversation. And then there's also a wealth of long-term planning that needs to take place because some of these are really complex uh, systemic challenges that cannot be fixed by the city council or by staff at the city, um, and they can't be fixed quickly. And so we really wanna take a short and long-term focus um, to the work. 
So with that said, I will pass it over to uh, Megan to talk a little bit about some of the um, community engagement that we have done. So this is in addition to looking at regional and national um, and local um, data sets such as um, census data or um, public health data. Um, we really wanted to get a sense from the community of what is happening here and what do they have to, to tell us about um, their experience. So with that, I'll pass it to you. Thank you very much. So like Tambi said, I'm gonna walk through a little bit about the methodology that we used for the needs assessment and then share with you some addition, some initial themes. Um, the, the really kind of a couple key pieces that we used in terms of the methodology. The first was a community survey, uh, as Tambi mentioned, which we completed um, at the be very beginning of this calendar year. Um, this was a survey that was accessible online to folks um, as well as um, paper copies in some locations in the city. Um, and it, since we didn't have uh, folks complete every question, right? Folks are, op are opting in and opting out. So you will see in the survey results that it's a little bit different by question, but roughly about 676 uh, com community members completed um, some portion of the survey. Um, in addition to the survey, we had um, conducted a couple of focus groups in the community over the last several months, as well as interviews with uh, key informants, whether that be providers or other kind of key stakeholders within the human services system um, in this part of the county. And then, as Tambi mentioned, we've, we've been looking at publicly available data, whether that be um, data from the Healthy Youth Survey, um, census data that's available about the city, and I'll be pulling a little bit of that into the themes um, tonight, as well as you'll see that in the final report. Before we get into kind of some of the, the nuts and bolts of the survey results, I wanted to share with you a little bit the, about the demographics of who we heard from. And I'll start with just an overall picture that in general, the survey demographics were representative of the community as a whole. So when we look at who we heard from, we look at it in comparison to the most recent census numbers uh, for the city. And in general, we heard from a good representative mix, whether we're looking at age, race, ethnicity, disability status, or other factors. There are a few places I think where there's opportunities for deep engagement kind of as the city moves forward with human services initiatives and I'll highlight those as I walk um, pretty quickly through the demographics. Um, so the first one that you see up here is the reflection of age. So you can see we had folks uh, with a range of, a range of age complete the survey, um, but a slightly disproportionate number of older adults compared to the city population as a whole. The next slide represents uh, race ethnicity. So again, a pretty good representation in terms of aligning with the city demographics. A couple of pieces I do wanna point out, we had an underrepresentation of Asian identifying residents, um, as well as a, as a um, Tambi, if you wanna pop quickly to the next slide, um, a, a slight underrepresentation of the Kenmore residents who identify as Hispanic Latin, or Latino origin. Um, and again, I wanna highlight these as really, I think, opportunities. Tambi was speaking to the, the little bit of the history around human services initiatives in the city. I think there's still trust building, right, that's happening in all of our communities around engagement with these types of surveys. So again, opportunity for future work. Uh, one piece to dig in a little bit more was just around language. So um, we did offer the survey, as I mentioned, it was an electronic survey primarily. We offered it in multiple languages, but really did see primarily English, um, folks who speak English as a primary language responding to the survey. Um, and that's a gap. With, who the, with, with the Kenmore population. So something to be mindful of um, as we look at the results as well. All right, and a couple more pieces here. Um, the disability, uh, disability status. So um, one of the things that we wanted to include was really a look at what was the disability status of survey respondents. We know that individuals who identify as having a disability themselves or someone with a disability living in their home may have higher human services needs. And so we're glad to see that that was a group um, that responded to the survey. And then finally, income. So when we look at um, the income of survey respondents, what you can see here is that uh, about a fifth of our survey respondents were at 80% of the area medium income or below, and then, and then another 7% at 30% area medium income or below. All right. So with that, we're gonna jump right into the survey findings. Um, and this first slide I have up here represents um, the, the first question that survey respondents were asked about human services, which is, what services have you accessed in the last year? And a couple kind of take home uh, messages I wanna offer here. I think the most important is that you can see in the bar um, in yellow along the left, those are 
those are folks who had accessed that service um, within the past year. So we can see that we heard from folks who are looking for human services in the community. So that was encouraging to see. An important point as you think about the next couple slides is that the series of questions that we asked next was about kind of what was your experience trying to access the service? What barriers did you encounter? And for that, we're looking at the subset of focus who had subset of respondents who had said, hey, I had a need for looking for, for support around affordable housing. And then they were asked some subsequent questions. So kind of as we move to these next survey results, you're really looking at the subset of folks that had said they needed something and then were trying to find it in the community. So this first one here, um, I wanna highlight, uh, highlight a couple of things. So this is, um, again, that subset of residents. And the first question I've represented here is the percentage of folks that said, I did not know where to access this service. So you can see, um, you know, we range from 12% at the low end to 50% at the high end. 50% was for domestic violence resources. So to take that, that uh, domestic violence resource example, of the individuals who took the survey who said, I needed domestic violence resources, about half said they didn't know where to go to access that service. So a really, really important finding with respect to knowledge of service availability in the community. And I wanna highlight that this was, a, this was a theme that was really echoed in the conversations that we had, um, both with interviews, um, some of our key informant interviews, as well as community members and focus groups who said, there's really a lack of knowledge among some residents of where to go, or if I have some idea, the complexity of navigating there is really challenging. And so really a, a need that was elevated for more support around how I get, how I find out where supports are and how I navigate to access them is a really key theme. This is, we kind of, we build upon this in the next slide and there's a lot going on on this slide. I'll start off by saying, so I'm gonna walk you through it bit by bit. Um, this far, far left row um, is folks who endorsed, uh, I knew where to access the service. Then you see the next one is, I was able to find this service in my community. And then next, I was able to find it in a place that I could drive to in a reasonable amount of time. And then that far gray bar on the left is actually the same one that you saw on the previous slide. I did not know how to access this service. So what I really wanna highlight here is actually those two middle bars, which are the numbers. So that blue, that dark blue and the orange in the middle, those are folks, the percentage of folks that said they were able to find it in their community. So find it in Kenmore or nearby and or find the service in a place that they could drive to in a reasonable amount of time. So you can see really, despite which service, which part of the human service continuum we're looking at, we really see fairly small percentage of folks who said they were able to find the service in the community or in a place they could travel to in a reasonable distance. And again, this really echoes what we heard in deeper conversations with residents and with providers, which was just a real, a, a real lack of very locally focused um, services and folks feeling like they Maybe they were aware of something in the broader community, but it was too far away to access and maybe not, um, not can more specific um, service areas. Okay. So the next slide you see here um, focuses on barriers to accessing human services. Um, so you can see along the left slide, a list of barriers that folks were um, that folks were asked about. And then on the right side, the bar in terms of the number of individuals that took the survey that, that endorsed that barrier. Um, you can see a range of things here and um, really a range of experiences. Um, some of the things that stand out in terms of top barriers that folks shared, um, care was too expensive or lack, lack of insurance coverage um, was a concern that folks um, pointed to. Um, wait time for care was another concern. So maybe the, the folks that were able to get to a service were having to wait a long time um, to actually receive the service. Um, and then another piece, lack of supports with, um, with specialized knowledge or experience to kind of meet the individual, the individual need. Um, I do want to highlight that though, you know, you see a lot of variability, right, in some of these barriers um, that, that I think there's a lot of, there's a lot to dig into here in terms of even, even some of the smaller numbers um, when we think of um, some of the concerns about quality, concerns about confidentiality, kind of opportunity again to continue to understand the res residents' human service needs and think about kind of innovative solutions to address the unique barriers that residents are experiencing. 
So the, the last bit of the survey I wanted to highlight. Um, so we asked, after we went through the questions that I've reviewed so far, we asked, um, give some opportunity for open-ended responses. And so um, I, I, what we've done here is we've done some initial categorizing of the open-ended responses. So this question um, that I've represented here, what, would, what are the top three things that would help um, better meet the needs of the human service needs of Kenmore residents? Um, and I just want to highlight particularly affordable housing and population population specific services, and I'll speak a minute in a minute to that. Um, really elevated as when we coded, we looked at all of the thoughts, the deep thoughts that folks shared with us around what the needs were, and put them into categories. That those were the two things that that rose to the top. When we look in detail at what folks are talking about when they're talking about population services, it tended to be kind of the, the most common response was um, services at either end of the age spectrum. So either services for youth or services for older adults. Um, and then some focus on uh, um, other kind of population specific items like um, services for individuals who are unhoused, um, services for individuals who um, that align with their cultural or linguistic needs, some of those kind of special population type of focus areas. Up here, what you can see is just a representation of the, the, rich, the richness of the perspectives that residents offered. Um, so these are direct, direct quotes from some of those open-ended um, surveys you can see um, in terms of what, what suggestions residents offered. Um, some focus on encouraging, kind of in, encouraging folks to come forth and decreasing stigma around folks identifying their needs, um, offering greater visibility of services, um, offering opportunities for additional navigation and coordination to services to address kind of that knowledge um, and access piece that I mentioned. Um, the quote here, just letting people know that services exist um, and I'm, I'm not aware of what's out there. I'm not aware of how to get there. Um, and then also, and I highlighted this here, city government and a community that works together to find solutions. I would say we heard a lot of comments like that of how can we continue to work together to think about kind of the, the unique needs of, of Kenmore and look at innovative partnerships, ways to bring service providers, residents in the city together um, to continue to strive towards better meeting human services needs. Finally, before we get into talking about some additional, some initial themes, um, we wanted to highlight, just kind of start to highlight some of the some of the publicly available data that really is on the whole, I would say, resonant with what we heard in surveys. And there's lot, lots of different data pieces we could look at here. Um, this, what we've pulled in here is the data on housing cost burden. Um, so this looks at these are uh, city of Kenmore specific. Uh, numbers. It looks at uh, what percentage of residents are spending either more than 30% or more than 50% on their housing costs, which is um, defined as cost burden or severely cost burden. And we've carried forward the number of households. So um, you can see 31 and 12% respectively, which represents um, you know, when we're looking at the 31%, nearly 3,000 households in Kenmore um, who are experiencing cost burden. And I will say one of the things that we really had a lot of conversation about with community members was um, that certainly affordable housing is a primary concern, but then also what are the downstream impacts of um, this housing cost burden on ability to meet other, um, other, other basic needs, which of course impacts um, human service needs kind of across the continuum of services. The other one we pulled out um, is that we really wanted to highlight was this is data from the um, North Shore, the North Shore School District's data from the Healthy Youth Survey. This is the 2021 data. The 2023 data just come out, so came out. So hopefully by the time we're finalizing the report, we'll have that. Um, but but just really highlighting, um, you know, and I will say when we looked at, you know, one of the things we're looking at with this data is what is the comparison? How is how does Kenmore look compared to other parts of the county, other parts of the state? Um, and when you look at that first, you're thinking, okay, well, we're, the city is kind of about in line with where Washington state is. This data represents um, depression, looking at grade eight, 10, and 12. Um, and then we sort of step back and say, wow, what is, what's the number of youth this is really impacting? So just to, to highlight um, the, if we go to the kind of far side, grade 12 of the graph, looking at North Shore School District, 12th graders, um, nearly 50% of students reported um, concerns about depression in the previous two weeks for the survey. So right about where the, where the state is, but um, again, a, a, significant, a significant concern both in Kenmore and statewide. Um, and you'll see as we begin to talk about themes, youth mental health, of course, being one of the, one of the um, areas for future consideration. All right. 
And lastly, we, um, you know, as, as I've been sharing this presentation, we've focused more, of course, on kind of what the, what the needs are that residents identified, um, but wanted to just elevate kind of the provide the, the ecosystem, right, with which, within which these needs are operating. And uh, we heard certainly from um, when we had interviews with uh, interviews with providers, joined coalition meetings. Um, we heard about the, the challenges that the human services sector is experiencing, um, really significant challenges around workforce um, that existed prior to the pandemic, but were significantly worsened. We pulled up here two um, recent local um, data sources. Uh, the University of Washington did a wage equity analysis, and then um, in 20, 2023, King County uh, released a nonprofit wage and benefits survey. Both of these just really highlighting um, highlighting the struggles, right, that, that exists for these organizations. Um, and I, th I think, you know, particularly striking that 71% of the nonprofit workforce were considering leaving their current position due to pay um, and cost of living. And it was something that we heard about in, with, um, from providers in staffing positions working in Kenmore specifically, is some of the challenges around uh, staff members not being able to work in the city and then transportation challenges getting here to and from um, being an additional difficulty in placing services locally. With that, I will pause. Tambi, anything about the survey results that you'd like to, to add? No, I don't okay. think so. Okay. And, we'll, and we'll have um, time for questions. Um, at the end, if that's all right, because we wanted to jump right, right into some initial themes, um, uh, looking both at the survey data and the community, co the conversations that we had with key stakeholders and um, focus groups and, and the publicly um, available data. And, and the, these things, these two, these top two things, um, I would also say really mirror what I've heard from my, my first day on the job here, which is that um, knowledge of the resources that are available is a huge need. Um, and locally sourced resources is a huge need. Um, we're kind of in a human services desert here in the middle of North uh, Keene County. And so folks have to go to Shoreline or Kirkland or Redmond or Seattle or Everett to, to find um, a whole host of, of resources. And that technology cannot always solve that challenge, um, especially with some of our more vulnerable populations. Um, and so I think, you know, just the, the data points that we put up here, you know, fewer than half of respondents knew how to access the needed services. Um, and, and I, I would want to kind of add a, a, an add on to that, which is, um, providing information is a short term to do. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, but also that resource navigation is beyond a simple flyer or a phone call. Um, many folks have very complex um, situations. There's a many compounding needs within a household um, and, and barriers to accessing that are beyond just knowledge. So whether it's an older adult with uh, maybe beginning cognition challenges or language barriers or access to technology. And so, yes, there are some short term easy wins that we can have in terms of disseminating information. Um, but when we're thinking about kind of a broader system, systemic approach and really meeting our residents where they are, it's going to require more than a resource guide. Um, and then also, you know, this, this lead for, need for local services and spaces. Um, this wasn't just about having service providers in the city, but also about having places to be and be in community, um, which is, you know, maybe beyond the scope of a housing and human services role, but it is within the scope of the city. And we've talked about this a bit in some of my other presentations that human services is also about sidewalks and parks and buildings. And these are things that the city can also be doing to grow community and grow health so that every resident has an opportunity to thrive. Some other um, initial themes related to this barriers to access. Um, again, just echoing that affordability at the cost of living is impacting many, if not most residents, not just our most vulnerable residents, um, but it is specifically um, impacting our, our lowest income, um, including our fixed income seniors, which we heard a lot about. Um, and that the workforce is often finding challenges in living here, which is again, exacerbating that access to services needs and increasing um, other challenges. 
limited transportation options are compounding that as well. Um, so for someone who has access to a lot of resources, maybe you can jump in your car or jump in a lift. Um, but if you have accessibility needs or um, are not able to afford such transportation, um, that can create another barrier. So it's not as easy as just getting 15 minutes away. It's a whole other host of challenges. Um, and then again, just highlighting those workforce challenges that Megan brought up earlier, it's really impacting access um, on a systemic level, not just in Kenmore. Um, and that's maybe not something that we can directly um, um, impact, but I think we wanna also focus on kind of large systemic things that we can think of in terms of legislative priorities or advocacy or other things. It's not all just problems that we can solve, but also things that we can be doing on a regional um, state and national level. So we took these initial themes, themes and came up with a, um, an initial um, stab at a, a funding priorities list. So there's, there's multiple hats that will happen or multiple avenues of impact that will happen within um, the city and within my role. And one is this, the grant funding that we have or the ability to directly source resources for, um, for our residents and in the region. And then again, there's also the, you know, that advocacy and the partnership and the lobbying, right? There's, but in terms of funding, I think it's, it, it's important that we have um, some clear direction from council about what to think about when we're doing grant funding projects processes in the future. Based on our um, uh, initial round of community engagement and the publicly available data, these five things have really stood out to us. This is where we would really love um, feedback and we'll, and I'll, when I talk about next steps, we'll talk about some other community feedback avenues that, um, that will take place. But the five that, that have stood out in no particular order are um, resource, resource and service navigation. So again, moving beyond just having a flyer, um, the informational and educational pieces will happen, but actually having um, dedicated staffing available to help people navigate these different systems. Um, thinking about housing affordability and prevention of homelessness, which includes basic needs, uh, food, utilities, et cetera. Um, service access and affordability for older adults, um, youth mental health. Uh, and on this one, I would, I would echo and elevate what um, Dr. Murray with, with Cascadia just um, highlighted. And you know, he was talking about educational attainment and how we're gonna have this whole, whole cohort um, for 18 years of students who, whose academic achievement was changed during the course of the pandemic. And that's true from a mental health perspective as well. You know, the mental health crisis that we're seeing amongst youth preceded the pandemic, um, but it was exacerbated during those three years and it continues to be um, uh, highly elevated. And I think in addition, we also will now have these cohorts of students that were in key developmental transitions in 2021 and 22 that didn't quite develop in the way they would have if they had not experienced the pandemic. So those little two-year-olds that were home for a few years or the teenagers that didn't go to middle school, like those are, those are challenges in a behavioral health perspective that will continue to have impacts and we'll need um, probably some additional and nuanced resources available to those students. Um, and then finally, that transportation support. We, can, we probably won't be able to, to build or bring in service providers at the, the drop of a uh, dime, but, but we can look at transportation support for folks who are accessing services outside the city. And then finally, we wanted to share um, a little bit about how we've pulled together some themes around the role of the city. So recognizing that cities play play lots of different roles, potentially with human services, um, and some feedback we heard here um, to elevate. The first was really um, acknowledging uh, what, I, what we've described here is the variability and depth of partnership with the city. Um, and this, this means that I think by nature of just the role the city has played historically, um, there's some, folk, some folks um, in the kind of human services ecosystem that, that expressed kind of a lot of understanding and awareness of what's happening within the city. And then some folks who are really unfamiliar, but unif uniformly folks saying, how do we, how do we partner better um, to meet the needs of Kenmore residents? And particularly those who might've been more dis disconnected saying kind of what's the opportunity Opportunity to learn more, share more about what we're doing, and look for additional opportunities for partnerships. Um, kind of along with that, um, 
providers really spoke to the, the role that the city can play as a cross-issue convener or a cross-sector convener in terms of bringing different parties to the table who have a stake um, in, of course, the well-being of residents and, and kind of all different aspects of the human services system to come together, recognizing the complexity of, of many challenges that, that Tambi spoke to, that folks have a lot of intersecting needs, and how do we look at things holistically rather in, uh, than in service silos. Um, additionally, folks highlighted the role that the city is already taking and continue to take and expand upon in terms of as an educator around what the human services needs are in Kenmore. We heard from some folks saying, I think there's not a broad awareness of kind of the diversity of needs that folks have and what the gaps are. And so then um, kind of how can we share that education so that that can then be used to help move human services initiatives forward within the city. Um, and then really kind of building upon that, the value, again, of a kind of a holistic or a whole person strategy when thinking about human services that incorporates um, what we describe here as kind of all components of a well-lived life. So all the things that folks need kind of to go about, go about their day to day. And how do you think about, um, like Tambi mentioned, human services, not only as housing support, but sidewalks as well, and kind of all the other things about community, um, community conditions that impact um, human services needs. Um, and then really thinking at kind of the last piece I would say is that we heard from a number of providers around um, the focus on as, as initiatives move forward, making sure that there's kind of an acknowledgement and awareness and an incorporation into the design of services, um, the acknowledgement of the systemic inequities that exist and the role of current and historic trauma and how all of that kind of comes together to make these challenges sometimes really complex um, to address. And so how do we focus on providers who are doing that trauma-informed work, doing that work that centers you know, culturally and linguistically specific supports and is really informed by community members and informed by the folks that are using services um, to really design kind of what best meets their individual needs. Great, thank you. So, so what's next? So I just, I would wanna start by saying, you know, this report is the first step of an iterative process. This will be an ongoing body of work. Um, we will learn, we will refine, things will change. We will learn and we will refine again. Um, and so I'm looking forward to hearing your feedback and reactions. And I also just wanted to, to preface that with some, you know, what are, what are our next steps as um, myself and the, and the HMA team? Um, I want to do another round of community engagement. I want to hear what the community's reactions are to some of our initial themes, some of our priorities, the guiding principles. So um, we'll be doing that over the next six weeks. Um, I would put a plug out to the community if you want to talk to me about it. I love I love to meet one-on-one -on -one for coffee or with small groups. If you have a, um, a, a faith group or a parent group or whatever, um, I am available and would love to to chat with folks. I know that it's my job to do the outreach to the community, but it's also really helpful when the community does some, some outreach to me and uh, invites me in. And, and I really am grateful for that. We are planning to do a, a May 6th community event prior to one of the council meetings. Um, I, I'm hopeful that we'll get some some new folks in the room for that. And, and again, kind of what are the reactions to these initial themes? What are the gaps? We know there are gaps. There were gaps in the uh, some of the communities or opportunities that um, we'll continue to work on as we build trust. And um, uh, But we want to hear that feedback so that we can create in the long term. We're looking towards creating these, you know, actionable short and long term recommendations. We're looking forward to creating a final report that can be shared with our partners and communities. The intention is to be back by late May um, with, with that um, long-term report so that we can shift into strategic planning and thinking about the next biennium, right? This is setting the stage for, for what is what is what are we seeing in the community that we can then have some short and long-term um, actionable steps and some grant funding um, determinations related to. Um, in the short term, there were um, some things that are already in the works and some things that I recommend. Um, in terms of education campaigns, that was just so overwhelmingly prevalent and has been something that I've heard, um, you know, again, from day one. And so there are some things already in the works. I've had the great uh, pleasure to work with um, Maria Trio Alvarado from the University um, Bothell campus on some landscape analysis of what's happening in the region in terms of human services. Um, that will be included in some of the follow-up reports to this. She's also um, thinking about how we display those better on our website. How do we make some maybe like rat, rat cards or, or paper resources? Um, because while we know that's not um, 
that's not a perfect fit for everyone. It is something um, that can be helpful to some. And if we have the information available, we might as well, uh, we should, you know, make sure we're disseminating it to the community as best we can. Um, we do, as part of our uh, 23 and 24 um, grant allocations, we do contribute to 211, which is a regional database um, that is one of the best online searchable um, and by phone resources. I do recommend calling them for any um, uh, community members in need. I personally find that their um, phone service is um, easier to navigate than their online uh, platform for whatever reason, um, probably because needs are nuanced and that's easier to explain to the person than a computer. Um, we're also working on a phone directory. This was started by Garrett and again, Maria at Uta Bothell is assisting with this. So again, so having some printed resources. So at least we have um, the best available information available um, to the public at the front desk or at the farmer's market or wherever. Um, we are also looking forward to, we were just selected for a project with, again, UW Bothell students, thank you so much for their support, to um, do an information campaign around existing assistance programs. So we we know that like the Puget Sound Energy Assistance Program is underutilized by Kenmore residents. We know that the property tax exemption um, program is underutilized by Kenmore residents. These are existing dollars that are just there for people who are eligible and we want to ensure that folks who are eligible are, are accessing those things um, and doing everything we can to call attention to them. So those are a few things that we have in the works in terms of education. There will be more. Um, there will be more ongoing relationship development, which will be incredibly important, um, especially with some of the, the opportunities that we saw in terms of information collection. That's a trust building um, opportunity. Um, it's a relationship building opportunity with different um, communities. Um, that um, and, and providers and, and systems that um, will be a big part of the work moving forward. And then finally, this, this idea of a kind of a, a term limited human services advisory group. As we think about strategic planning, I don't believe strategic planning should be done by one, one staff member and one consultant, um, no matter how well intentioned or well resourced they are, it's, it should be a community involved process. And so um, I would love to work with, um, the community in some kind of way to think about our long-term strategic planning, um, put some things on paper, get your approval, and think about 25-26 um, grant funding. And with that, I think that is our last slide. So any questions for us? Any feedback for us? Questions, comments? Councilmember Shubnick? This was fantastic. <laughs> Great, great work. Um, Tambi, you are, we are so lucky to have you. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, and really good feedback. I mean, it, really good feedback um, from the community on this. I mean, I think we learned, I was a little skeptical when we first delve into needs assessments, like, oh, we already know a lot, but I mean, this really kind of fleshed out some things that we did already know, but it really kind of, um, you know, wrapped it in a bow and kind of, you know, helped us, you know, more fully understand things. So that was super helpful. Um, one little kind of nuanced thing in the presentation that be, was actually clear in the data, but less clear in the presentation. A couple of times in the presentation, um, you were talking about percentages, but they were actually numbers and didn't have percentages. And then whenever, I, it's super helpful to me and I think other people, when you are presenting percentages, also you know, make sure you have the ends. Be, so for example, um, one thing that you know, just sort of leaped out when we were looking at the percentages was the high percentage of people who didn't know how to access DV services. But then when you look actually at the numbers, it was like 14 people, which is, which is not to say it's nobody, but in comparison, mental health services was more than 10 times that many people tried to access. And of course, you know, relatively the percentage of people who struggled was lower, but the absolute numbers were much, much higher uh, of people who struggled with that. So I think you need those both together to really understand, you know, what's the scale of the problem that we're looking at. Um, so that's kind of one thing. Um, two questions. Uh, well, one you kind of answer, so I think maybe just more explanation on it. But um, one question was, um, 
around the opportunity that the hope link, um, you know, uh, what was proposal, I guess, or the, you know, the partnership with hope link imagine housing, um, will present to us. And, you know, it seems like, I mean, I guess, you know, some thoughts I had and I wanted to ask you was, you know, the, the resource navigation seems like, you know, that would be unnatural there. And then the other two would be maybe a hope for is, um, um, you know, benefit application workers and kind of insurance benefit application. And then, and it'd be amazing if we could get maybe a satellite office of a behavioral health agency too, that would be my fantasy. Um, I, so I'd be curious what you think about any of those. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> You know, Hope Link previously, <clears throat> excuse me, had a location in Kimmore, is my understanding, um, kind of in North Kimmore, and they are very excited um, by the possibility of coming back into kind of the middle region of North King County. Um, having that kind of, um, those kind of services available in such an accessible location uh, is ideal. I when when that was part of the proposal that we received as part of that RFP um, with my human services hat on, I will say I was elated, and I am very hopeful that um, that we do have that partnership because it would be a tremendous benefit to um, Kimmore residents to have that kind of access to a service provider that provides such a scope of services, it's food, it's utilities, it's housing, it's, I mean, other than behavioral health, they hit most of the buckets. Um, and that in conjunction with the Kenmore Senior Center, that would be, um, we would no longer be a human services desert. Uh, we would we would be really well equipped to help a lot of um, our residents in need. I would like to put in a plug for the behavioral health piece. I, I do really, we are in a desert here. Um, and particularly, I mean, you know, youth, at least there's something out there for youth, you know, Center for Human Services, it's too far away, but, you know, they're fantastic. But for the rest of the population, there really isn't anything. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, whatever it takes, I really do feel like, you know, the data support that there is the need that we all thought that there was. Um, and then the last question, I think you kind of said that the, um, the, advisory group would be term, time limited, term limited for the purpose of the strategic plan. I just wanna. That would be my initial okay. proposal. And then perhaps as part of the strategic pro planning process, there would be a different recommendation that come out of that. But I, I would like us to do that process and get your feedback before making any long-term commitments to a group of that nature. That would be my recommendation. Councilman Lucas. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you. This was fantastic. It's, it helps so much to see. And I think it's it's really necessary when it comes to driving our decisions and, and how we prioritize things going forward. So I just want to say first off, thank you both to our consultant, to Amby, to Stephanie, everyone who worked on this. Thank you. This was this was wonderful. Um, if, you know, really quickly, I wanted to echo what Councilmember Shrebnik said. I think behavioral health is a huge thing, as we saw, especially with youth. That is absolutely critical. And although there might be some um, relatively nearby services, they're not still not accessible to youth. Uh, I, I know that some are are maybe you know in Shoreline or over in Woodenville, but to a, a members of our community, younger members of our community, sometimes they're, they're going on that journey alone. And so their accessibility is quite limited. Um, and, you know, I'd be happy to speak more about that too, one-on-one -on -one if, if you'd prefer. Um, so I just want to emphasize that too, and just highlight that it's the needs of youth. They're uh, magnified, I, I guess, because they don't, they, they're not able to access some of the services that um, older folks in our community might be able to on top of that. Um, a really quick question. So the human services advisor group, I know that affordable housing was pointed out as a huge thing here. Would that sort of be a, a housing and human services advisor group or how did I, I'm just looking for some clarity on what that would look like. I think with, with my human services hat on, when we talk about affordable housing, it's more homelessness prevention and accessing affordable housing it's not necessarily the other part of my job, which is 
potentially building or working with developers of affordable housing and thinking about what that looks like for the city. I, they're very interconnected, and yet I think there's there's benefit to keeping them a little bit distinct in this setting um, because they are different systems that operate in different ways. Um, so the advisory group could be whatever we want it to be because it hasn't been created yet. But um, for this specific kind of term limited group, the initial idea that I had was to keep it focused on human services, strategic planning, and um, the, the next round of grant funding to help make some of those recommendations. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, that helps provide clarity. So I appreciate um, a little more detail on sort of what you had in mind there. Uh, and then my last question is, uh, does the city often do say a human services fair? I am not, I don't know if they've done one in the past. Um, human resource, resource fairs are certainly possible. Um, uh, I know some of the, one of the avenues that I've been researching recently is um, DSHS does uh, mobile fairs with some of the local libraries. So for example, they recently did one with Shoreline Library. Unfortunately, the Kimmore location doesn't have the right parking access for it. That doesn't mean we couldn't bring it into a different city site. So that is one possible um, opportunity. And, and the real benefit of that is it's kind of a private, um, a private consultation with folks who are already entrenched in the system and know kind of exactly what type of journey to take folks on to access those benefits. Um, a more general resource fair is absolutely something we can do. Um, and maybe we could do maybe, a, you know, pilot as a component of a, um, a farmer's market or whatnot. I would always add the caveat that um, there's a deep amount of um, stigma uh, associated with accessing a lot of these services. And, and to really understand what someone needs, you often have to ask uh, questions about deeply private information. Um, and so that would always be my caveat on doing some kind of broader fair. It's, it's just a little bit talking about mental health or food benefits or, um, it's just a little bit different than maybe your general health and resource fair. And so I would wanna have, um, have that kind of at front and center with any planning that we did. Absolutely, and and I completely that makes perfect sense. Um, and I wonder, you know, as my the gears were sort of turning, if it's possible to to have both and concentrate effort and resources. And and part of that is I know that when it came to accessing services or knowledge of services, that's always a, a huge challenge. And how do we do that and reach out to people? But if you say close down a block and have banners and stuff for, for the public, the general stuff, but also an, another facility. I don't know where exactly where that would be with more private stuff. In addition to that, that no, not only I think gets people's attention and it would also, um, you know, I, you can do with this as you, as you wish. I just wanna preface this, but also um, connecting, I think regional resources all in one spot, all in one day, mobile clinics, um, mobile dentistry clinics, you know, the the other nonprofits who can just come up here for a day and, and kind of lay all that out, I think would get people's attention and then kind of be an on one stop. Um, but again. I really, I really appreciate the ideas. I received some similar ideas via the email. I think it is important that we are creative and um, have use a variety, wide variety of outreach methods um, and that that really should be a huge component of my work plan over the next 12 to 18 months because there's clearly such a need. And so while we can't solve all of these challenges with just information, there has to be a baseline at least that we set in terms of knowledge of resources um, in this region. So yeah, thank you. Well, thank you again. Um, this, this is fantastic and I appreciate all of your work. Thank you. Councilor Marshall. Thank you. Um, yeah, I join my colleagues in the emphasis on behavioral health and especially among youth, respect to the need to balance privacy with the advocacy, as you're mentioning, of something like a fair, uh, a information fair. But on the other hand, I've seen more progress, I think, even in the stigma with regards to mental health in my life than I never thought I'd see even like, I don't know, when we were teenagers or something. We, we didn't op as openly discuss suicide or suicide prevention and certainly within the lifetimes of our parents. So there may be hope on that. So I join my colleagues in the behavioral health. It can also be helpful 
for uh, yeah, maybe even a substance abuse support here, which supports getting out of homelessness as well because it supports sobriety. So that's another great aspect to what you're doing. That's Mark Culver. Yeah, I'll jump in with a couple of things. Uh, I, I had written in and you've addressed a lot of that, so thank you. This presentation of rocks, super instructive. Y'all knocked it out of the park. Very informative. Uh, love it all. I, I think everyone saw it, just want to call. We got another signal of clear priorities from the community, affordable housing, again, number one. Uh, I think that's good to follow that signal there. Um, the other piece, like fleshing out this this um, mobile idea in the, the library, like I, I really like that concept. I, I just wondered if you could help like, are there any good gold standards for outreach? Like, totally understood that a phone call doesn't always cut it. You know, even a, a library approach is only going to reach so many people. Like, is there anything that's like, yep, that's the, this is what the industry loves to do? Or is, is it just different for every person in their own sort of situation? I can add some thoughts, and I'm sure, I know Tammy will have some as well. I mean, I, I think there's a, lot, there's a lot of discussion out there. There's a lot of different models. What I would think is that, my initial reaction is that there's gold standards in terms of principles um, of how that outreach happens. So some things that come to mind, um, I think we're best off if we work through existing relationships. So, you know, where can we partner where folks are already embedded with community, there's already trust built rather than than someone new coming in, right, to offer that information. So um, that's, I think, one, one, one piece that comes to mind. Um, and then I think to just echo something that Tambi shared earlier, the other top principle is really um, kind of what are, what are the models that can provide ongoing support? So I think what we know is that the informational models get to uh, you know, a portion of, of the population, but that these systems are so complex to navigate and often folks are navigating them when they're in crisis. So someone who can partner along the way, kind of at every step of the way and build a relationship and be kind of that consistent person when I have a need to say, oh, I got, I got this far and then I got stuck and then there's this form I don't, not sure how to complete or I got a, got rejected from that service, where do I go next? Um, because those hurdles are so many. Um, and so, you know, I think there's lots of different kind of specific, I know there's lots of different specific models that you could dig into as gold standards, but I think they all come back to a couple of key principles. So, Tandy, anything to add? Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. It's so much of, especially with these complex um, situations, so much of it is relationship building and trust um, to be able to, to, again, kind of walk that long-term path with folks. Um, some folks can have just a simple conversation and a simple solution to a simple problem, but that's not always um, what, what households are, are bringing into these situations. And so, um, yeah, I agree. Cool, yeah, super clarifying, thank you. Um, the only other thought that I had, and this is somewhat adjacent, but validated, I think, a bit with the survey of um, knowing that cost has been an access or, you know, lack of coverage and that sort of stuff. You know, I'm also cognizant of the kind of macro level statistics that uh, cite like medical debt as like a huge, like, I think the number one cost of bankruptcy in this country, get in my sub speech. Uh, but I've, I've seen some cities actually um, apparently you could just bulk buy medical debt and cancel it for like pennies on the dollar. Um, I'm just throwing this out there, but like many cities and jurisdictions have done that. And it's apparently there's, there's folks out there that do it. So might be something to explore. Um, obviously this conversation is more active services in the debt per se, but, uh, something to consider. So anyway, really appreciate this. So thank you. Deputy mayor. I, I want to thank you for your um, efforts and work in putting this really important report, this needs assessment together for us. Um, I echo, I, I just want to say I support a lot of the comments that um, my fellow council, our fellow council members have made, um, especially a lot. I loved the point about even adding one behavioral service center here in Kenmore partnering with the senior center because you know it doesn't it's not going to take that much for us to bring this together so as we're building this work together one center for this city is going to make a huge difference in accessibility like the scale with because I look at it, it's like so big and I'm like oh wait there there are small things that we can do to really make big improvements um, I appreciated the thought that you gave to the human services 
advisory committee, I fully support the separation and dedicating to the strategic or towards these strategies, towards this approach. Um, and I have one more thing, not significant. It's really a big piece of gratitude because as we're moving forward, we need to actually understand what our community's needs are so that as we are approaching this new important part of our city's work, that we're effective in our community's needs. And I, oh, I'm just so thankful for your approach to reaching out to the community, going to where our community is and seeking input, actually taking the time to say, I would love you to invite me too, you know, and I know you mean that. And I really appreciate that's what it takes. I mean, the, you're, you're helping lead our city to success in this area. And I want to thank each and every one of you for your work on this and you Tambi in particular, because you, you took the lead on this. So thank you. I'm not going to repeat everything that my colleagues have said. It's part of the fun of being mayor as you go last. Um, but um, I did want to say I really thought the um, things that were brought out in the initial theme slide were like they made a lot of sense given the um, given the data and the responses that you've gotten from community. I think there's a lot of support for the things on those slides. And um, I think it's a great place to start. A um, couple of other things. One, I was just thinking about um, as part of community court, they also have those community resources fairs once a month in Shoreline. Is there any way we might be able to yank one of those out every quarter or so out to Kenmore or better leverage that? Um, that was just something to think about a little bit. We can certainly look into that and see and bring that back as, as what the options would be. Yeah, because they, I mean, they bring together a lot of people all in one place and it's open to the community. It's not just open to people who are part of community court. So that would be a kind of a one-stop shop for a lot of folks who are seeking services at least. Um, and something you reminded me about uh, in this last legislative session, there was a bill put out by Representative Gildon, um, Senate Bill 5943, which would have originally directed um, or uh, essentially an app for uh, Washington residents to be able to find all different resources available to them, state resources, but also local. And, and um, you know, it, it would essentially force uh, people who are getting state money to make sure that they're making their, making it easier for folks to find them. And it'd be kind of a, again, a one-stop shop for folks. It didn't make it out of, um, it didn't pass. And then they tried to make it into a budget proviso that didn't survive in the budget negotiations. But it is an interesting idea that I think we should keep an eye on um, in the next legislative session is something we, we might want to support because anything we can make it, any way that we can make it easier for folks, not everybody wants to call two on one. I mean, I've toured their facilities. I've talked to their folks there. They do amazing work. Um, but also it's a lot of waiting on hold for a lot of people I've heard, you know, their wait times can be really long. Um, and some folks are kind of fed up, you know, like they've tried it and it didn't quite work for them. So they've given up. Um, I'm a big supporter. Um, this would be in, in concert with two on one. They would have been one of the groups brought into the advisory group to put together this app as it is. But um, just something that I think we should be aware of because I think that's a tool that we could also um, leverage. So, but I want to say thank you very much for all your work, Tammy. This is really quality stuff and I really appreciate it. Anything else? All right, thank you so much. Um, staff report, affordable housing discussion schedule presented by Community Development Director Debbie Bent and Housing and Human Services Manager Tambi Cork. Good evening, Council. Um, tonight is just a short presentation to give you an update on activities related to affordable housing. There is no action or direction this evening. It's just a status 
update. We provided a memo and your packet that goes into a little bit more detail, but we have a short PowerPoint just to hit some of those highlights. So. <laughs> Um, so we're going to talk about what's coming in 2024 and 2025 as part of a affordable housing work plan. Um, in 2025, um, we would hope to add policy and regulations updating the city's affordable housing strategy, which was adopted in 2017. Um, and the um, housing element, this would be a strategy, again, is one of the implementation strategies to update that plan. Also updating development regulations for supportive housing types, including permanent supportive housing, which would be to implement state law that was recently passed. Policy and regulations in 2024, uh, middle housing policy and regulations to, again, implement state law. This is part of the city's current 2024 docket, and we're also looking at accessory dwelling units, cottage housing, and small houses on small lots. Uh, we have to get the comprehensive plan adopted by December of this year. That's the mandated deadline. The state gives us till June 2025 to implement the middle housing regulations and ADU regulations. So if we can't get everything done this year, we do have a little bit of wiggle room, although we are planning to try and get everything done this year. F fingers crossed on that one. In terms of project um, on 2024, um, negotiations will continue or to start actually, related to the Imagine Housing proposal, which is currently known as the approach. And this is for the city owned property on 181st Street, formerly known as the Holt property. We're still here, okay. Um, so just to get, add a little bit more, affordable housing policy 2025, um, updating the 2017 adopted affordable housing strategy. And, and the city has implemented and, and taken quite a few actions related to implementation in terms of direct funding activities. Uh, we contribute to the Arch Housing Trust Fund. We've adopted many regulations uh, around affordable housing. There are kind of a few are highlighted there on the screen and there's more that's on the city's website. And in terms of projects, um, council direction last December was to move forward with negotiations for land sale of a price of $1.5 million to transfer the property and any other necessary agreements for the Imagine Housing project. So that's what's going on in, in terms of housing policy. So we're on middle housing. No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I need glasses, I think. Um, supportive housing regulations. So the state law that was passed requires jurisdictions to update their development regulations for transitional housing, supportive, permanent supportive housing, emergency shelters, and emergency housing. And collectively, this is known as supportive housing types. Current city regulations do not prohibit any of these supportive housing types, but, we would like to, in 2025, update the regulations to provide more specific requirements. For example, to include operational agreement requirements, security plan requirements, community relation requirements, and consider modifying land use regulations related to density and parking. The Department of Commerce is, is currently working on a model ordinance, so that will be useful information to provide background information to help guide that conversation. And we'd also be reviewing regulations that have been adopted in, in other jurisdictions, including Redmond and Bellevue. Um, council, uh, several council members have also suggested um, as part of a community engagement effort, the potential of forming a a committee to provide feedback. Um, so again, if, if that is the direction of council staff would, when we get to that point, request more direction in terms of um, how resources to, su to support that. 
Uh, we'd also be looking at broader community engagement. We would be looking at input from providers and looking uh, for assistance from ARCH policy staff. So that is the plan for 2025. I, I know that there is interest in trying to do this sooner, trying to do it th this year, but I can't stress enough that we have a really full plate in terms of trying to get the comprehensive plan adopted by the end of this year. So it's not that we don't want to do it, we do want to do it, we want to be strategic and when we do it. And we would like to do um, supportive housing in conjunction when we update the housing strategy plan. And so middle housing. Uh, the city was fortunate to receive a grant from the Department of Commerce. Uh, to assist with developing implementation regulations. And that consultant is Kimley Horn. Um, so we have them under contract right now, and they will be assisting staff in developing the amendments to land use and housing elements of the comprehensive plan, developing those implementing zoning regulations, not only for middle housing, but for accessory dwelling units, um, also consistent with state law, cottage housing, small houses on small lots. So this is a work program item for the Planning Commission. Uh, we will be giving them background information and they will be bringing forward the recommendations to you uh, later this year for, for adoption. Um, we are planning to, to come to council on, thank you, on April 8th. Uh, we've also invited the Planning Commission. It makes sense for, for both groups to hear the information at the same time to provide that background information about middle housing and to kind of talk about some of those policy choices that the state law gives you. We do have to do something, but even so, there are still choices. So it's important to have that discussion early and frame that discussion for council and the planning commission to have an early discussion about those policy choices. No final decision, again, an early conversation and perhaps some early direction on that. Um, also, uh, we are planning then on the 15th, if, if council I understand is holding a, a town hall and at the last town hall meeting you had a housing table. So if there's still a housing table at the town hall on the 15th, we are more than prepared to come and have information ready and have that conversation with the public and maybe even be able to have some sort of engagement activity as well. We were planning other engagement activities throughout the summer at the community events, at farmers markets, open house, and we will be updating our website to do some online engagement as well. So um, next, um, Imagine Housing, and I'm going to turn this over to Tambi so I can stop talking for a minute. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, as you all know, in back in December, um, the initial proposal um, was ex was um, approved by council to move forward with creating a partnership and some negotiations related to uh, the property, um, formerly known as the Holt property, um, in conjunction with Imagine Housing, Habitat for Humanity, and Hope Blink. Um, the Imagine Housing team is the lead on that um, development, and they are currently preparing a revised schedule for next steps. We anticipate receiving that schedule in the next few weeks. There's many components to this. They have a due diligence still to do, site environmental assessments. They have not yet had a pre-app meeting with our development services group. Um, so they'll be coming back to us and we'll be able to provide to you a preliminary, preliminary schedule, um, including things like property transfer agreement, permit actions, community engagement schedules, um, funding applications, but it's really, it's just too soon yet to know what some of those dates are. Um, we hope to receive some more information by the end of this month and then be back to you in April um, with some rough timelines. Um, but again, we're just still very early in this conversation. Um, and so there's no um, action or feedback needed at this time. And as promised, it's a very short presentation. Uh, any questions from council? Questions? Councilor Mark Colburn. Just a quick one and, and understood on the 25 timeline with permitted supportive housing and taking that up. When does commerce expect to have their sort of model language done? Any ballpark on that? I, I, I wish my crystal ball was clear. I don't know. Sure. Yeah. Cool. Right on. Thank you. Councilor Marshall. It's really to the city's credit, the council and the staff and our citizens that we're already on at least one component of the requirements, and that's the emergency housing for uh, the emergency shelters, which we had quite a while ago. So that's great. 
Um, I just want to remark it's, I know it's way vastly early, but I think maybe early and often maybe the key for my vision on uh, missing middle housing and how we can balance that with our support for the environment. And my thoughts are, uh, we'll see what comes out of the planning commission for sure. But I think something that might go a long way towards balancing is um, transportation impact fees so that new developments, if there's a massive increase in density can support a neighborhood sidewalk rather than just sidewalk on the frontage. Um, prox that great proximity to transit that council member Lutz says when he was on the planning commission, his planning commission came up with that recommendation. I still think that's awesome. And then uh, some way to incentivize, perhaps not require, I'd love to require it, but um, perhaps if we can't do that, incentivize no new impervious services or to keep impervious services down on new developments. That might go a long way towards preserving the environment. So my, that's my one of my first early and often pitches. Thanks. Councilor Sharpnick. Well, and I'll riff on the early and often, <laughs> early and often uh, community engagement. I love how this um, speaks to that. And I really appreciate how you've um, incorporated um, our thoughts around having a time limited um, advisory group. Um, I, I feel like all the, all the ways, all the different ways of having community engagement are really going to be key. Um, you know, we had unprecedented, um, outpouring of, of, um, comments on permanent supported housing. So I, I really do feel like that is worthy of, um, being creative like this and, um, thinking about, um, a range of strategies. Um, so I, I appreciate that. Councilor Lucis? Yeah, just echoing that. I think we want to keep the community on board throughout this whole process, and that should hopefully facilitate a smoother ride um, and you know a, a better product that everyone is is um, on board with at the end. So when it comes to um, community engagement strategies, I know that a few were listed. Is that or I mean, is is there um, are there plans to maybe include it in the quarterly and send out mailers and kind of just do what 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 we have available to us? When yep, it comes all to the that? things. Okay, all the um, yeah. online surveys, yes. newsletters, all that um, open houses stuff. I don't have a firm schedule, but yes, we understand that we're looking at a a variety of techniques to get input into this topic. Yes. Great. I, I just didn't want to limit it. I make sure that that's that bulleted point was, you know, just uh, not the extent. So yes, that's perfect. Um, but again, as always, thank you so much, both of you for um, putting this together. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, You're Tambi. Welcome. This is uh, fantastic and it, it's, it's uh, invaluable. So thank you. Deputy Mayor. Yes, first, thank you for this update. Um, Excuse me. Um, thank you for the update. And I just had some thoughts about the committee because we had gotten some, um, you know, co comments and feedback and insights from from staff. And I think one of the most important things for us to do, if we are going to be leaders in this suburban supportive housing or all affordable housing, is to ensure that we have an inclusive approach to participants on the committee. So people with lived experience, people who are in the industry of support. I also think it's really important for us to open the doors and ensure that we have taxpayer payers, people who actually live in our community, people who wanted to participate that didn't support the last project because I think it's really important to bring us together and make sure that we're listening to each other. Because I think there was sincere, sincere interest in being a part of the solution from our community. And by opening that door, we will be modeling ways of preventing things like we had in the past. And I know it sounds scary to have people on the other side participate, but there were a lot of people who want to be part of the solution and that is us modeling that we are listening to our community is 
this is something we don't have a choice about doing, and we certainly want to make sure our community is on board. So making sure that we don't judge someone just by um, their, li you know, I think it's important to be open is what I want to say. Mixed, diverse views, a, a broad spectrum. And I heard a lot of support for this work and people wanting to be involved. So I just wanted to open that door to courage in that space because I think that's where the healing begins. Thank you. Also, I do wanna say I very much support the timing for 2025 and being very well prepared for this broader work that you mentioned. So I genuinely appreciate you um, looking at the schedule ahead and what we really can do and how we can be most effective. Thank you. Yeah, I wanna thank, um... Thank you for all the work on this. A um, couple of things. One, uh, I think it might be worth us revisiting a little bit our um, emergency uh, shelter ordinance when we get when we go back through the affordable housing um, section there. Um, I just know that in this last uh, go around, um, our ordinance that we had passed a few years ago essentially meant that we that the entire city of Kenmore was taken out of uh, consideration when it came to a severe weather shelter. And I think that's, um, I think we're, you know, letting down our regional partners when they can only really look at Bothell, Lake Forest Park um, and Shoreline. And luckily they were able to find a location over in Shoreline, but you can see that's not super central when it comes to serving the North End cities um, and being able to serve people when it's 15 degrees outside is something that I hope we can get ourselves to supporting. Um, and then, yeah, as far as the committee goes, when we're talking about um, uh, PSH in particular, um, I, I could support this idea. I think we really need to have strong guardrails around what the expectations are, because at the end of the day, this is, as Deputy Mayor, this is something that we do need to allow through, through zoning and permitting. And um, we need to have very, strong expectations at the front of this is this is what the conversation is is it's not here it's not there it's not um you know passing shadow zoning that essentially stops psh from coming to kenmore we need a set of realistic uh regulations that will result in housing being built and i think that needs to be very clear from the outset and anything outside of that would not be acceptable to me um so we need really strong guardrails on that i agree we need to hear from people with different perspectives, of course. And, and I also think we need to make sure that we have, you know, developers, um, you know, affordable housing developers there, um, people with experience, all that sort of, you know, we need to make sure that we're hearing from all the different folks. But at the end of the day, it needs, you know, personally, I think, you know, a group like Arch or somebody who has a real background in PSH needs to look at whatever comes out and say, yes, this will work. Um, because if it's not going to work, then we just waste a lot of folks' time and, and raise people's expectations that what they're doing is something that we'll be able to implement. And at the end of the day, if we get something that comes to council that is not going to result or is going to block housing from being built, then I think we're going to find ourselves in trouble. Um, and frankly, I think that would be a waste of everybody's time. So I just think we need really, really strong, clear guardrails around all of that and what the expectations are. So... Other than that, I really appreciate everything here. Super helpful. Any other questions or comments? Councilor Culver. Yeah, I'll dovetail the mayor on this one. I had previously voiced support for the idea, you know, with the intent indeed of bringing in more of the community. But um, I think hearing some of this further discussion and consideration and folks have written in has, has brought me to a different conclusion, um, especially with the, the presentation laying it out perfectly that community is divided, you know, support and opposition in relation to permanent supportive housing. I, I think everyone at this table knows, um, you know, but I'll highlight it just for the purposes of discussion. Uh, per state law, cities can't prohibit permanent supportive housing. Uh, quite the opposite. I think we all know that we have goals for it. So, you know, I would, I wouldn't want the committee to set up a, a, a notion or an impression that this is a, this is a debate, right? This isn't a, a yes or no. And I, I think several people have said that, but I think that's brought some pause for me. So um, I don't think a committee is the way here. I think we have proper channels through things like the planning commission and city council. And I think there's other ways to reach out to folks and make sure that, that folks are included in the process. It's an ongoing thing and it, you know, we're going to have to, to grab it by the horns, but um 
yeah, I, I do appreciate you sort of uh, putting this in the, you know, as an item on the uh, agenda tonight to discuss more concretely, kind of coalescing that into a point. So yeah, appreciate you all. Okay. Great. Yeah. Deputy Mayor. Yeah, I just, I just want to tag on that after the trauma that we experienced over the past six months or, you know, three months in particular um, related, you know, January to through December related to uh, Plymouth and the community um, engagement that we received. Um, it's incredibly important that we follow through with what we said that we want our community involved and that we did talk about having a committee. I agree with making sure that there are guardrails. I think that's it being a limited term committee kind of puts that together, but we will have to put that together. But following through on our words that we said, we want to hear from you. And I can't reiterate enough how important bringing our community together so that they say, I got to participate in this. I understand the full spectrum of this. We have obligations here and this is how we're going to, we're going to approach it as a city. People, we need to follow through on that opening. I, I can't reiterate it enough. Councilor Lucas. Um, so I, I think that, you know, there could be some benefit in further discussion. I'm not saying one way or another right at this time. Um, I, I do think that um, hearing some of what my colleagues have said that, you know, there, there, it, it, there's, there's enough potential benefit to at least talk about it a little bit more and maybe see what that could look like. Maybe it extends beyond the scope of the planning commission. Of course, we understand that the city council has the final say on anything an advisory committee says. So it's not like um, an advisory committee would be given free reign on rezoning the city, um, but to, to gather insight, input, community perspective, which I think is critical when we when we talk about the, the deep and multi-dimensional nature of affordable housing and of homelessness and things like that. We, we need a lot of perspective, a lot of creative ideas um, when it comes to addressing that. And I could see some benefit being the, the wealth of knowledge that we could bring to the table and that sort of discussion. Um, it's not to say that, um, you know, that there uh, may not be some debate or discussion in that, but that's that's part of working through finding a, a, a more sustainable answer to the problem. And I think just one one point to put on that too is, you know, it's it's not focused on specifically maybe permanent supportive housing, but uh, affordable housing as a concept or housing as a concept, something more broad where it's it's not gatekeeping, it's not providing barriers to one specific type of housing, but looking at how can we solve this across the board and how do we keep housing affordable for our current residents who are being priced out. I think that's another um, important consideration when we talk about affordable housing as a whole. So it wouldn't just be focused on on this narrow thing, but um, I, I think those are some important ideas to, to at least keep in mind talking through this. Again, you know, I know we're not making any decisions tonight, but just having some discussion. Well, if I could just kind of respond, I mean, I think you've all got ideas and what it is and what it is and what it should be and what the topic should be, which which leads me to say that there isn't kind of a consensus right now on what the council's expectations would be for this committee. So I think, again, before we kind of dive into this, the devil's going to be in the details in terms of outlining what the purpose of the committee is, the time frame, the number of committee members, who you want to serve on this and the topics that you want them to discuss. So for sure, we, as a staff, we would have to come back and provide some options for you to consider before we jump into this, because right now you've all got very different ideas and expectations of what this committee's purpose would be. I appreciate right, next, those comments and we'll yeah. be back. Yeah, no, well, actually one other thing that I think would be worth um, digging into, or at least uh, I'd like to hear more about is what does the planning commission think about this also? Because some folks are right. We are kind of, this would on some level either undermine or kind of circumvent a little bit of their work. And I think it's worth hearing from them on that. Councilor Shubnick? Yeah, on that note, I mean, I'm assuming that when you bring back what this is about, all those things that you were saying, mm -hmm. it would it would address the distinction between the planning commission and 
and the advisory committee. I mean, I was I was assuming that because I think that was some of the concerns from that we've heard. And to me, there's enough distinction that it mm -hmm. is not a problem. And you know, we obviously want to respect that. Um, we, you know, we had such an outpouring of folks who want to be involved in the solution that we don't want to close the door behind them and just say, oh, well, we've got existing committees. We'll just use them. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, we do need some clarification. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm understanding that, or I may I just ask, we're not, you, you don't feel direction right now to come back with a plan for the community. I don't know that we have given enough direction no. or, or you're no, right. This, you, this was just kind ready. of, this was just kind of to give an idea. You've mentioned this and you've kind of, you know, you're jumping right in now to give us, you know, some, some of your thoughts and ideas, but I'm not taking that as direction about what it would be. There needs to be more um, discussion and we would certainly do that as a staff and kind of take into some of these points and bring forward a plan for what that committee would be. Okay. Whether that would be later this year or, or early next year. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So we've got some time in between here yeah, and there. We, as we, we have, we these have updates time to, throughout the year. we have time to, to yeah, figure so stuff that we out. Can yeah. kind of filter so, in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just absolutely. wanted to make sure because I'm like, I'm not ready for you to do bring us something 100%. No, no, I'm not, I'm not ready either. So, okay. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Councilmember reports and comments. Councilmember Culver. Nothing to add. Thank you. Councilmember Marshall. I made a foray into Swamp Creek last weekend on an art project and was struck by the beauty and the full spring effect. And also I made a foray, I think for the first time into, uh, doggone it, it used to be, used to be JR's, but now it's the uh, new tavern down the street. whose name, somebody's gonna have to like win this contest and remind me what the name of the tavern is before the end of my speech but uh the tabs tabs okay see the mayor got it um did karaoke there and as i was stepping out to walk home i was struck by a massive overwhelming chorus of frogs you can totally hear it it's so loud downtown it was great i love it it was great and all, all along also the utility road towards this area and by NUD and it's I was amazed at how small or how narrow that wetland is and yet it was still like just packed with uh the, the chorus of frogs and even despite the new construction everything so that's encouraging to see the resilience of nature council member Shepak uh, so many committees um so in PRSA um so they are proceeding with a, we are proceeding with a, um, a needs assessment. I think I mentioned that before. So that'll happen this spring. And um, that will be for a youth slash community center concept, but the needs assessment will be um, asking the community what their uh, recreational facility needs are more broadly. Um, so that's an opportunity for input. Um, and then toward the end of the year, I believe, or summer, fall, um, there'll be a um, site uh, analysis, site feasibility analysis um, for where a facility based on the survey uh, might be located. Um, so looking forward to that. Um, and um, at the same time, that group is, um, I think I mentioned this before, uh, kind of gearing up for the 2025 uh, levy. Um, and also thinking about whether for that levy or for a subsequent uh, voter approved measure, some uh, aspects of the facility repairs and capital improvements to the Kenmore location might be included in MPRSA. So that's under discussion. Um, uh, RLSJC, so Regional Law Safety and Justice Committee. Um, I mentioned before that uh, we had asked several questions about the, uh, and actually this is for RPC as well, Regional Policy Committee. Um, it came up in both the Crisis Care Center levy and how that's being implemented and the relationship of that to uh, the Crisis Care Center um, for our North region. And 
the relationship to that facility is still under discussion. There could actually be uh, a second facility in the North region if the existing facility um, does not agree to all of the conditions that the county has. So that would be an interesting wrinkle. I, I don't think that's gonna be what happens, but um, it is not settled at this point. Um, so there's that. Um, and then as one of the early implementation features of the levy, there's going to be a significant um, expansion of mobile crisis services. Right now there's, um, I think just one or two teams, mobile crisis teams that are deployed plus a youth team. Um, and it'll be expanding to 10 teams uh, distributed around the county. So that will be a a massive um, expansion of the availability of mobile crisis services. So that's huge. Um, uh, let's see, so that was RPC. Uh, RLSJC also talked about um, some of the legislative wins around vehicle pursuits um, and also uh, domestic violence um, survivor dependent, uh, excuse me, survivor defendant program. So when uh, domestic violence survivors um, are also uh, defendants, if they um, um, assault their perpetrator, typically, um, there's a program now um, with the prosecutor's office uh, to um, uh, essentially quash uh, the, uh, the charge and have some programming um, to support that um, uh, survivor defendant. Um, so I wanted to uh, let folks know about that. I've let um, Brandon know. I, I couldn't quite tell from the, the response whether he already knew about it, but we're trying to get the word out about that program. So I think that's most of the committees that happened recently. Councilmember Lutus. Uh, happy spring, everyone. The cherry blossoms are looking great right now. Other than that, I have nothing else to add. Deputy Mayor. I'll be attending the Puget Sound Salmon Recovery Council meeting on Thursday. So at our next meeting, I hope to provide an update. We'll be going over legislative updates, federal priorities, and the Salmon Recovery Plan addendum. So I'm looking forward to that meeting. It's an all day, and um, that's about it. So thank you. Councilmember Sasson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me? Sure. <clears throat> um, I appreciate the uh, ability to participate virtually this evening. Um, this, uh, these presentations dovetailed uh, pretty beautifully with the council, uh, with the uh, committee work I've been doing on NUSA and the North County um, Hopeless Project. So I am uh, paying particular attention. It's probably a good thing that I wasn't in the room. I'm sure I would have talked way too much. <laughs> so um, that's really all I have to say. Thank you all. Thank you. And I have nothing to report today. So with nothing else before us, we are adjourned.